Welcome to Conversations with Art Informal. We are with Carlomar Dawana, writer and recently now the chair of the Fine Arts Department of Ateneo de Manila. And we will be talking about Jose B. Ayala Jr. and his ongoing exhibition, When the Eye Wanders Inward at Art Informal Makati. Thank you for joining us, Carlo. Great pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Carlo, let's begin by talking about this artist's very intriguing biography and personal history. What do you know about him? Jose Ayala, he didn't uh, set out to be an artist uh, originally. Um, he took up agriculture, if I'm not mistaken, at, the, at UP Los Baños, and that was what guided him in his career. He was an agriculturist back in Davao. In fact, there is this, go, you know, like a, a story going around that he was the one responsible for making Cavendish yellow uh, the mm -hmm. way Japanese importers uh, wanted it to be. Uh, as an artist, as a, as a visual artist, little is very known about him, although he produced a lot of work in his lifetime, about 30 years worth of uh, creativity and artistry. A bit of a background about uh, the artist. I read that he had a painting schedule. It would be between 1 a.m. to 4 a.m. And during the day, he would be working at the plantation. Yeah, that's correct. It was like his meditation, some kind of a, a prayer for him uh, just to to still his mind and to kind of focus his attention on this singular thing, which was painting. So he did that uh, religiously day in and day out for, for decades. Are you familiar with his Eastern psycho spiritual practices? The, the, what I, I know about Jose Ayala was the fact that he was uh, into um, Eastern religious practices. He was into Buddhism, Sufism. He was into meditation. He was also cognizant of the visual language of mandalas. So that's the reason why he also had a series of works that were mandala-like in their composition. So it was pretty much part and parcel of his creative process. That's why painting for him was an act of meditation and concentration. So that's really what, that's what the visual art gives to him, a kind of a stillness of the mind. Because he was self-taught and largely disconnected from the commercial side of, of, of art, would you consider him classified under art brut or what is not popularly known as outsider art? Mm. That's a very tricky thing to do, uh, how to situate Jose Ayala in terms of art history, uh, particularly Philippine art history. But you're correct. There are cer certain precedents, such as, you know, art brut. It could also be classified as um, abstract expressionism because it was like the inner world that was being expressed in his works. But in the Philippine context, it's hard to, to place him, really, because uh, first, you know, his abstraction is different. It's not purely abstract. There are elements that are still recognizably images, but he's not entirely a realist as well because those images don't resemble anything in the outside world, in, 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 the, in the natural world. So sometimes you would have elements like flowers and leaves, but these are not botanically accurate. There's nothing like them in the real world, although he is surrounded. He was surrounded by plants uh, because that was his uh, livelihood, but I think there were combinations of these botanical elements, like hybrid, uh, hybridized forms of the flowers and plants that he knew so well. But, but yeah, they're, they're purely invented. Maybe let's talk about some of the paintings in particular. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a favorite from, from this show that you would like to focus on? And maybe we can also talk about his palette, which mm -hmm. maybe speaks of a certain era, but is also not based on reality? First, perhaps um, I could kind of describe them uh, in general terms. Okay. Because Norman Chrysologo was uh, able to fantastically create works that resembled 
a certain a certain way, meaning to say a combination of landscape and still life. So if you uh, just like the painting that you showed us um, in the in the lower bottom or lo lower mm -hmm. half of yes. the of the composition, you would have the elements. Uh, some of them mm -hmm. are plants and flowers. Some of them are just shapes, perhaps terrains, um, and then at the background, usually conveyed by a uh, you know, like a set of <laughs> intoxicating uh, color palette, you would have a suggestion of sky or, or landscape. So, so pretty much uh, definitive in terms of how these works resemble uh, each other. So, and in my catalog text, uh, I mentioned that it's like a combination of landscape and still life in one, but certainly these are not the landscapes and still lives that we're familiar with. These are surreal, otherworldly images. And if you look at them, it feels like you're being transported to another world, the world that is invented by, um, by the artist, something that is reflective of his own inner vision, his own personal view of the cosmos. So these are very spiritual reflections that achieve visual shape and color and all these other elements so that, you know, he's able to transport that to, back to us, mere mortals. <laughs> in, in that sense, his works are very original because he doesn't seem to be referencing anything except his own beliefs or his own practices. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, that's correct. Um, it's very self-contained. Um, it's like, you know, he had the vision or a glimpse uh, of the world and he would paint it away. And if you look at the, the work closely, although they kind of um, share the same um, iconography of combining um, still life and landscape, not two paintings are the same. Cannot even connect one painting to another in terms of like colors and in terms of shape. So, uh, so it's like, you know, it's just like a fleeting glimpse of this inner world. And once uh, Mr. Ayala was able to capture that on in pigment and canvas, and that's it then another revelation happens. What is the size or qu the quantity of his body of work? And would you be familiar when Norman made a selection, how many did he have to choose from? Did yeah, you know? uh, yeah, I don't have like the, the exact numbers, um, mm -hmm. but if we are just to approximate uh, it, mm -hmm. that he, he was painting one work a day for the last how many years, then we're talking about thousands of works. Um, I was fortunate enough to actually see a, a sample of this work. It ranged from a, a small work, like say one foot by one foot to something that, that's also large scale. So pretty much, you know, he moves from one size to another as much as he moves from one visual idiom to, to another. So there's that uh, flexibility. So we're talking about thousands of works. Uh, some of them have not yet been archived. Some of them have not yet been unrolled, uh, basically, because they're still in his studio in, in Davao. And I, I mentioned this earlier uh, during our, our pre-interview uh, that there was no assiduous attempt to archive his works. And also his works are not titled. And his works are also not dated. So there is also that, that, uh, that issue or uh, about his work but it's not you know like the art historians would have difficulty perhaps of doing the, the categorization but but that also means that it's an open-ended story you know that you could enter it from different vantage points and in this particular exhibition a vantage point in which landscape and still life uh, are combined in one work. Did he keep all these works private and no one ever laid eyes on them until until after his death? Yes. In fact, he was so secretive and guarded about his work. So when his friends would drop by and, you know, uh, and chat 
him up and ask if they could get the work, uh, he would say, you know, he's not yet ready or, you know, he's, um, there is no work to speak of. But actually, he kept mostly, most of the, the works. Um, although he had an exhibition at the NCCA, I, I think in 2014, but that was it. If anyone would have like the 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 courage to ask to to buy one of his works, then he would just like say say no. So he he the, the collection stayed with the family, and it was only after his death that these works are, are getting seen by by the public. Because he told uh, his daughter, you know, the daughter asked him, uh, where would uh, you know where when would people see these works? Mr. Ayala would say, you know, there will be a right time for for that. And I think this is the, the right time for it. And now, you know, people are beginning to understand the kind of contribution Mr. Ayala has done or has given to Philippine visual arts. But more than that, he provides a different tangent um, and understanding of the creative process um, because some, this is something that we're not usually aware of. We're aware of the, you know, the rags to riches story, you know, but nothing like the, the you know, like the, the romantic notion of the, the artist toiling in his studio, protecting his work, uh, not showing his work to any anybody, uh, even his family, and just doing it for, for the love of the process. And now, um, we're, we're accessing these works and we're, we're getting familiar w- with them and with the contribution that uh, Mr. Ayala has given to Philippine visual arts. Would you know if most of these works were acrylic on canvas, like in the exhibition, or was he also using other experimental materials? Mm-hmm. I'm not too, too familiar uh, with the, the medium, but I think he, he has a certain flexibility in terms of materials used, but I, I think the, the colors of the acrylic, you know, the brilliant colors, the glossiness of acrylic uh, pigment kind of was commensurate to the kind of, you know, to the images perhaps that he had, that he saw in his, in his mind's eye, something that was luminous. Um, I think that's a more appropriate word. And I think um, uh, acrylic was able to give him that. Although not too familiar with his oil on canvas work, but most probably there are works like that. And that's really the challenge of, you know, just understanding uh, Mr. Ayala's work. What about Art Fair Philippines 2019? How did it suddenly, surprisingly, a whole collection was shown there? And I know you were also the writer for that exhibition. Yeah. Tina Pericat, Dindin Araneta, and... Uh, Tricky Lopa. Tricky Lopa. Tricky Lopa. Uh, Lisa Pericat. And Lisa Pericat. Uh, they are aware of uh, Mr. Ayala's work. So I think they got in touch uh, with the family. And it was uh, Monica Ayala, uh, the daughter of Joe Ayala, who's uh, the sister, of course, of Joey Ayala and Cynthia Alexander, famous musicians. Um, he was, she was the designated keeper of the works. And uh, they got in touch with her. And the family agreed uh, to show a sample of his works. And I think that the range of the works uh, that were shown in, in Art Fair Philippines uh, was was indicative of the, the processes that he and the styles that he tapped in his decades of uh, productivity and, and artistry. Were you the one who made the selection for, for the, that oh, show? Um, I think it was a collaboration between Art Fair Philippines and also the, the family. It was a, a good sampling of Mr. Ayala's works. Have you been able to speak in depth with the family? Yes, uh, I had to interview Monica Ayala so that I would have a good handle of the life story and also how the paintings came to be. I went to their house in Quezon City. I think it was the house of Joey Ayala. I I met him there, but it was Monica whom I I conversed with and and interviewed about this this work. So that's why I was able to uh, share the earlier tidbit about Joe Ayala was just painting and painting, and there was no exhibition in sight for those works. Uh, He was just creating art for its own sake. And uh, Monica asked him what going to happen uh, with these works and Mr. Ayala said like you know there will be a right time for these works to emerge and it wasn't 
that time. So that's why, that's why he's pretty protective about his, his works. Would you know if there are any plans now that people know about his works to include them in education or perhaps is there a book being put together? Right. You know? uh, yeah. Not too aware about um, books, but I think uh, the the exhibition at Art Fair Philippines and also at Art Informal will prompt scholars, art historians to place and situate Mr. Ayala in the, the canon um, because it's pretty much obvious that there was talent here and it off also offers us a different trajectory in the development of abstraction in the Philippines. So I think that story has to be accommodated. And also, in addition to that, we're talking about an artist from the regions. That could be a model for certain artists who are not into like the, the noise of the, the art world and perhaps wants to step away or step back from it. That there is someone that you could look up to or someone that could provide a model for that of an artistic practice that is uh, done in in private and in the solitude of his studio. Mr. Ayala had a day job that supported him. He had a wonderful wife, Kita Lacambra Ayala, who was also supportive of, uh, of his husband's uh, art making. So given that, it's just fascinating to just discover basically an artist uh, from many decades back who didn't stop painting, um, who didn't, who didn't pay much attention on what was happening in the art world, but just like so, so, soldiered on. And with the belief, of course, that that the, his works would eventually be, be discovered and be um, and be viewed by, by Filipinos. Before Jose Ayala became a painter, he was an award-winning short story fiction writer, and he would also write poetry, plays, and essays. And as a writer, Carlo, do you see traces of, of that in his paintings? Oh, um, that's a very good question. Because if you look at their, their family, their, it's really a family of artists. Tila, Tita Lacambra Ayala is, is of course, uh, a very uh, respected poet. You have, uh, you know, Cynthia Alexander and Joey Ayala, who all write and compose their songs. And you would have Joe Ayala, who started in literary arts and ended up being known in, in, in the visual arts. If there is a, a connection, I think really it's a belief in the artist's vision. Um, because, of course, as a fictionist, he would invent scenarios, he would invent um, uh, conversations, uh, he, would vent, he would invent set, setting. And I think this um, emphasis in um, invention in, you know, uh, magical forgeries, if I may call it that, uh, got transported into visual arts. Although there is not much narrative in the, in the works, we could detect the sense of, you know, just like the confidence, really, that the world, uh, no matter how, the world that does not resemble ours is actually something that's credible. And I think that's part and parcel of uh, a writer in terms of world building. This is Joe Ayala's way of building a world through, uh, through visual arts. Carlo, do you think that there is something we should touch on that we didn't, that we forgot? Oh, that um, we must include? Hopefully people get to see this exhibition because it's kind of rare actually to have a show by Jose Ayala. These works are, you know, properly stored and archived and all of that. It's like an archaeological feat, uh, if I may call it that. And of course, uh, there's also that uh, interface uh, with like the, the family, who's also protective of uh, Joe Ayala's legacy. So, um, so yeah, um, people should be able to um, to see the show if they can um, uh, read up a bit on uh, Joe Ayala and his uh, legacy. Uh, and hopefully, um, you know, it opens up a bit of uh, another story in Philippine visual arts.